Okay, great. Thanks, Amy. So I'm very excited to have Internet2 here. For, for those of you in the second two groups of bar charts, uh, Internet2 is a nonprofit community organization, uh, and I think their genesis was around the high-speed network, and they've branched out and are doing cloud solutions, research support, and they help um, higher education, uh, research universities like ours, government, and also uh, cultural organizations. And so we have a great crew, uh, Ananya Ravapati, who's a research cloud engineer, Bob Flynn, the inestimable uh, program manager, uh, former IU um, leader of their cloud um, stuff over there, and in charge of cloud infrastructure and platform services uh, community here. Dana Brunson, the executive director for research engagement, uh, Linda Roos, Director of State and Regional Networks at Internet2, Oren Shribni, um, who's doing consulting around cloud services at Internet2, and Sarah Jeans, Product Manager over EduRome, which is a whole topic unto itself, Identity Federation, software, and things like that. So we've got people who can speak to really all aspects of Internet2, and so I won't use up any more oxygen and we'll turn it over to them. Great. Hey, thank, thanks, Bill. Um, <clears throat> so uh, thank, thanks for having us. I think Bob is going to share his screen and run the, run the slide deck here. Um, so uh, thanks. Um, so first, first off, it's really great to see, see everybody here and, and uh, some old friends and, and some lots of faces that are new, new to me anyway. Um, so it's a terrific opportunity to get get to meet with people from Berkeley. Um, I'm Oren Srebni. Like Bill said, I'm a consultant with the Internet too, and uh, I get to play the MC for this this um, for this session. And uh, yeah, hi Jen, nice to see you. <laughs> um, so uh, first off, it was great to do that little poll, and I just want to say to everyone here that you have used internet to services whether you know it or not and uh, by the time we get done with this little little romp through what we do and and what and how we're doing it you, you'll probably have a better appreciation for that so um yeah great opportunity so uh i'm the token old guy in the room so so i get to do the history the history part here um so if, if you'll all those of you who are capable think back to the mid 80s uh the beginnings of the internet were really with the national science foundation uh creating what was called nsfnet which was the original uh internet networking network and connected really the national labs with the supercomputing center was the, was the genesis of the internet um and then in the mid 90s um the internet had grown to a point where the national science foundation said we don't need to run this anymore and we can get out and leave it to the commercial sector to to take over and that really instilled a level of panic in university cios that the commercial sector wouldn't understand the needs of the research and education enterprise across the country and uh and they a group of of 34 university leaders mostly cios got together at a hotel airport airport hotel in in near o'hare in 1996 and decided to build their own national network um, that would service specifically universities and research institutions and that really took off and uh, there were 80 higher ed members by the end of that year and that formed the genesis of the internet to network and in 1998, um, the Abilene Backbone Network, which is the net, was the national network that Internet2 built, uh, was announced at the White House. And everybody likes to show this, this picture of uh, the Internet2 CIO with Al Gore, uh, because it's our one of our claims to fame, our 15 minutes. Um, so, so really, as, as Bill said, the, the original genesis of Internet2 was building the National Research and Education Backbone Network, and um, Linda will talk more about the state of that today and, and where it's at and how, how that works. Um, in 1998, it became obvious that 
you know, just connecting people together on a network wasn't enough that we were going to have to do something about uh, identity and authentication and authorization and internet to launched its middleware initiative, which is really responsible for the genesis and, and ongoing maintenance of uh, things you probably know and love like Shibboleth and Grouper and uh, Edurome and a, a bunch of other things that, that we'll talk about in a little bit. Um, and then, uh, you know, about 10 years, 10 or 11 years ago, it became obvious that we were moving, you know, rapidly moving into the cloud and we needed to have better stories together as institutions about how we do that. And that formed the genesis of Internet 2's Net Plus initiative, which uh, is a, really the, the heart of our cloud initiative. And then more recently, uh, we've really be, begun an engagement to support research initiatives across institutions and uh, how to how to support research computing and and Dana and Ananya will will talk to that in more detail shortly. Um, and as you can see, this is sort of the the spread of activities we're engaged in now. There's a lot going on. Uh, you'll hear more about it in the next little while from all of our colleagues, and uh, we welcome your your participation and your questions. Next slide, Bob. Um, you know, the primary point of Internet2 is to act as a place of facilitation and engagement for higher ed and research institutions and people who work in IT in those institutions. And when we say people who work in IT, we mean that broadly. We're not just talking about central IT people. We're talking about uh, researchers. We're talking about people who support researchers. We're talking about people who work in departments and colleges and national labs. We're really uh, trying to build the community of people engaged in computing at higher ed and research institutions. So uh, you'll hear more about that. We welcome your participation. If you're looking to get involved, uh, and we hope you are looking to get involved in our national efforts, uh, we look forward to talking to you more detail after this presentation. So having said all that, I'm going to turn it over to Linda to talk about the network. Thanks a lot, Oren. And hello, everyone. I'm Linda Roos. I uh, am the Senior Director of State and Regional Networks at Internet2, which means that I work within the Network Services Group. Um, and thank you for switching the slide. I, I looked up a couple of things about Berkeley. Berkeley uh, actually connected to the, to the network in 1999, and Oren said that the Abilene Network was announced in 98. Um, I know Berkeley was one of the very first. And Berkeley um, works with Scenic as the local, the regional network within California. Um, so if you've heard Scenic, Scenic is uh, the entity that gets you to internet too. Um, so we have had great participation by um, people from Berkeley within the, the community um, from a networking perspective. And Oren was mentioning that um, Internet2 does facilitation. Well, the community is the thing that makes everything run, really. Um, and having the participation of Berkeley over the years just makes the whole community be stronger and certainly makes what Internet2 does be better. Uh, this slide shows just some basic numbers. You're one of those uh, 320 plus, um, as I mentioned. Um, and this tells you a little bit about the network. Um, we have uh, 15,700 miles of dark fiber that spans the network. And actually, Internet 2 even will take you outside of the, the US. Internet 2 is a US based network, but we do have pairing relationships with networks around the world. And so by being part of Internet 2, you're really part of a, a global Internet, not, not just a US. Uh, so next slide. Thank you. Um, we are at our fifth generation of network. Um, 
and this one is called NGI. Um, it is being built right now, actually. Uh, the month of April, we've been spending in testing mode, and uh, we will be beginning to move uh, services that um, Scenic has over the next few months. So um, it's a very exciting time for us. We, of course, in network services, this is what we live for, the, the new network being uh, implemented. Um, we, I mentioned that the community is really at the heart of what we do. And um, NGI, the, the whole effort kicked off with a community engagement effort. We brought the community together and we asked them for the things that were important to them to have as underlying tenants for this network. And so these are the five use cases that are driving the implementation, the, the design, the implementation of this network. Um, and so uh, data intensive research, enhanced cloud access, software driven infrastructure, sustainable economics and infrastructure sharing. Well, uh, sustainable economics, we're, we're gonna have to pay for this. And you know we want this to be, um, something that the, the community and internet too, as an organization can certainly afford. Um, infrastructure sharing, um, we want the community to use this infrastructure just as much as possible. Um, from, from the regional networks like Scenic to uh, institutions like Berkeley and uh, K-12 schools, I know you have uh, a lot of K-12 schools within uh, California that are also connected, public libraries, um, and so on. Uh, enhanced cloud access. We need both scale and functionality uh, out of the cloud infrastructure. Um, and we all know that the use of the cloud is growing. And I'm going to just uh, talk very briefly about some of the uh, efforts to get people connected to the cloud um, within network services. Uh, Software-driven infrastructure. Um, we want optical up through the IP layers to be exposed at the software layer through APIs and portal access uh, with telemetry feedback about what is going on in the system. This will be the next place that we will be focusing is on um, the software part of things. Um, and so there'll be a lot more to be said about that um, as we move forward. Um, and then of course, uh, data intensive research. In some ways, uh, data intensive research was the reason that we decided to have a network. Um, and it's not just about large bandwidth, but it's also facilitating the use of that bandwidth um, to consume what the platform provides. Uh, next slide, please. Thank you. Oops, back one. Okay, well, we always like to have a baby picture. This is what we call a baby picture. It's almost hard to keep up with the baby because the baby is growing so fast during this implementation phase. Um, each one of the, the blue and green lines will be a 400 or 800 gig link um, as we get going. Um, and we've already talked about some of the other things that are driving this network, the software driven infrastructure and um, uh, it, what it's going to be used for data intensive research and cloud connectivity and so on. Um, and when you look at this map, you see that the infrastructure spans the US. Well, Scenic has such a network, uh, a similar kind of network where their infrastructure spans the state of California. And they, they bring the network closer to you so that you can get on the Scenic network and then they will uh, pass your traffic to the Internet 2 network and receive traffic back from the Internet 2 network. So Scenic is a really important part of this community effort from a networking perspective. Um, and I'm, I'm believing that you all know what Scenic is. I, um, they, they do great things in California. 
Okay, so uh, next slide, please. Okay, so the other thing that I wanted to talk about briefly is our networking for cloud. Um, this is three different services that you can use to get to get to the cloud. Um, in each of these, you will be you'll be leveraging uh, your both the connectivity that you have through Scenic and Internet Two. So again, this is a place where Scenic and Internet Two work really closely together. Um, I2PX. Uh, the, the three services are I2PX, I2CC, and I2RPI. Um, I2PX uh, leverages three terabits of public peering that we have, um, and this allows you to gain access to services in the cloud. You might use I2PX um, for Zoom or Office 365 or other things. And Scenic already provides you with peering. So even if you, you may not even know that you're using I2PX, it's not like something that you need to do. Scenic has already, um, it has implemented that service for, for the institutions within California. So I2CC um, enables you to take advantage of uh, direct connect solutions um, from three major cloud providers. Uh, and uh, you use it for uh, AWS Direct Connect, Microsoft Azure Express Route, and Google Cloud Platform Partner Interconnect. Uh, it is used when you want to extend your infrastructure in, into the cloud. Perhaps you're considering moving an application that's running in your data center now to the cloud. That might be um, a time when you would use I2CC. Uh, I2CC is offered uh, at capacities of up to five gigs for no additional fee. So again, you're using your scenic infrastructure, Internet 2's infrastructure. And so um, to reach Amazon Direct Connect, you can uh, have a connection of up to five gigs. And it's available, I2CC is available in four locations around the country, Ashburn, Chicago, Dallas, and close to you all in San Jose. Um, and then I2RPI is, allows you to have uh, a 10 gig port at major peering points around the country. It is right now those same four locations, Ashburn, Chicago, Dallas, and San Jose, but we expect to expand that after NGI is built. And you can use it to uh, connect to a cloud provider other than the big three. Or if your needs exceed the five gig, gig limit to the big three, um, you can use RPI instead of Cloud Connect. There is a small fee and we work with uh, Scenic and um, they would charge the fee to you and we would provide the RPI service in conjunction with Scenic. So uh, RPI is a way to provide you with resiliency, uh, allowing you to connect at multiple sites around the country. Um, and you can use this to connect to the cloud provider of your choice. So either use your 10 gig port to uh, connect to the big three at greater than five gigs of capacity or any provider around the country. We have um, entities that are connecting to um, SIP services, entities that are connecting to esports exchanges. So really, whatever you can dream, we could help you with that. So um, at the end of this slideshow, there is um, a, uh, an email address, Cloud Connect Request. If this is something that you're interested in, we can have an individual call with you and we invite Scenic to the call too because the service is provided um, in conjunction with Scenic and uh, answer all your questions. Um, I see that someone asked about Oracle Cloud. Uh, right now, you can certainly reach Oracle Cloud through using RPI um, and we are, um, we, uh, 
I'm glad to know if you're interested in Oracle, that is the way that we begin to expand any um, offerings is first through the community. And of course we have to go through a process of evaluation. Um, so knowing that someone here is interested in Oracle Cloud, I'll certainly take that back. But if you're, if you need, if you're in immediate need, we can sure do RPI for Oracle Cloud. Back to Oren. Thanks, Linda. Uh, I'm just going to pass it on directly to Sarah. Yeah, thanks, Linda. Thanks, Oren. So I am Sarah Jeans. I'm the product manager of Edgeroom, but uh, I'm here broadly speaking about uh, in common and our broader suite of uh, identity and access management services. So part of what you'll see is as we talk through each of these sections of the presentation, we're building layer upon layer upon layer. Uh, identity access management is, is lovingly referred to as one of the middleware layers, which means you probably don't see it very much, but you're probably interacting with it actually quite a lot. So uh, what, you'll, <laughs> uh, what you'll see is uh, uh, UCB and uh, more than a, a thousand institutions participate in something called In Common, which is a group of more than 12 million uh, uh, identities users uh, using the service and uh, using a federated identity uh, capability that's privacy preserving and short lived and uh, we work uh, kind of alongside uh, a, as it were a privacy preserving uh, Google uh, Federation and working with your institutions to access services, so these thousand institutions are working together um, to grant access in a, a really uh, strongly secured and, and private way to uh, other services. Oh, we also, uh, we also have a, a, a significant uh, certificate service uh, that uh, serves over uh, a, a million web certificates since 2010. I see I'm being sped along. Uh, so on my service in particular, uh, and probably the name that you're most familiar with, uh, possibly throughout this entire deck, but uh, definitely in the identity space is Edge of uh, So if you're on campus or if you're near campus, you're probably connected to Edge of uh, for uh, accessing Wi Fi today. Uh, Edge of is a great way that you can see um, all of these great services under the hood and, and is a way to. Uh, refer to uh, all of the underlying work that you all and your colleagues are doing in, in the identity space as well. And uh, while I don't show it here, this is also an international service. I know one of my colleagues went to Eastern Europe and was able to literally use the app on their phone to find uh, access points and find user universities and get to use their university credentials to uh, access those services and get online. Uh, next slide. So underpinning this whole conversation, uh, we also work with the broader community, with you all, your colleagues at universities, uh, other national labs to create uh, an identity uh, software suite. Uh, it's open source, it works really well together, uh, and it helps drive this identity federation. You may have heard of, of Shibboleth logging in, uh, but there are also an, any number of services underneath it as well. So uh, there's Grouper for groups, there's CoManage for uh, guest services and user self-service. Uh, we've recently brought in a service called Midpoint uh, that helps provision cloud services. So you can provision and deprovision users to cloud services and ha has all sorts of connectors uh, in it. I see another shout out for Grouper. Uh, so I'm glad you're, you're able to expose all of the complex, but all of the, uh, the great underpinning technologies that um, you all serve out to your campus. Next slide. So one of the ways uh, that you're going to see these uh, technologies manifest themselves, not only in something like Edgeroom, but uh, in interactions with the NIH. So this is a bit of a technical slide, but what I really wanted to point out here and what you should take away is that the NIH has taken notice and we, and internet too and in common have worked with the NIH, the National Institutes of Health for a long time, um, but they've recognized the work the higher education community is doing and uh, recently, uh, towards the fall of last year, they signaled that uh, in order to access the research administration service, we're going to need to 
not only use federated credentials, but also flag different attributes. So uh, making sure that the, uh, the details that a, a university discloses about the research faculty is narrowed in scope and appropriate for the use case, uh, making sure that those credentials also have multi-factors or you're using a, a two-factor methodology or multi-factor methodology and actually signaling that to the service on the other side. Uh, and then also making sure that there is some level of identity proofing so that the person with the credential uh, is uh, appropriately accessing a research service because these might be some really sensitive data sets that you're working with at the NIH. So uh, it's great to see that others in our research and education community are recognizing all the hard work that you all have done and your colleagues have done in this space and really starting to see that the, the uh, end outcomes and, and really the rewards of all that work in uh, creating this kind of end-to-end -end recognized solution to access uh, what's ultimately really a cloud resource and a, a cloud data set. Next slide, please. So uh, I know I'm, we're doing a quick speed through. There's uh, a whole bunch of, of services and different technologies we could flag for you all and any of these literally has multi-hour presentations on them. But uh, what I wanted to flag here was that we have a, an entryway and a pathway. So if you're interested and, and maybe you're in a field that's uh, related to identity or adjacent to identity and interested in learning more, uh, the great place to start is an event called Basecamp. And I'll link it in chat when I'm finished uh, with these slides. But uh, it'll let you, it'll get you introduced to all these technologies and how they all fit together and kind of start you on this pathway. We're really interested in, in focusing in the last couple of years on growing uh, the community. Uh, frankly, the identity community is getting older uh, and a lot of these same folks uh, in the uh, early aughts uh, are retiring and we wanna make sure that we've got a lot of great minds uh, in the community to move these forward because the identity problems uh, continue to be complex and continue to be something we need to work on. Cloud wasn't really even conceived of until the late aughts. So uh, we can need to continue to evolve these technologies to address modern and current needs. Next slide. So this is just my recap slide. Uh, I touched on I think each of these services. Uh, you'll have seen references to certificates, the Federation, Edurome, and, and our software is branded as a trusted access platform. So definitely keep an eye out for us, incommon.org is the website, uh, and you can internet2.edu and incommon.org. We're, we're all the same team, but we cross link to each other's websites uh, and you'll see references there and I'll drop a link to Basecamp in chat. Thanks for having us. Oren, you're up. I yield to my colleague on the right. All right, well, I'm coming to you from a dark place. No, uh, hi, I'm Bob Flynn. I'm the program manager for cloud infrastructure and platform services. And I'm gonna be talking to you about the Net Plus program. And I'm gonna see if I can advance my own slides and talk at the same time. It's a delicate skill. All right, so the Net Plus program is the ability or the desire for schools to create kind of a supply demand balance uh, between the, the, the vendors and the institutions. So we're not all going alone, uh, not only negotiating our own agreements, but do, putting in the same time to do the same thing. So we leverage these identity standards that uh, Sarah talked about. We leverage the networks that Linda talked about. Um, we put in place the standards and the contracts that are important to all higher ed institutions. And we then develop conversations and ongoing relationships with these vendors to allow us to continue to put forward and prioritize what's most important to higher ed. So uh, we look for unmet needs in the market. We try and challenge the suppliers in those space. We don't pick winners and losers. We ask schools to come to us. You need to have at least five institutions who are willing to stand behind a service to get it evaluated for an, as a net plus service and brought into the portfolio. Um, we can have competing solutions in the space. Uh, originally, so currently I manage the GCP and AWS services. Originally, there was a, a Net Plus Azure uh, as well, but uh, then Microsoft saw fit to give 
the same contract to all institutions so there didn't end up needing to be a net plus uh, version of the contract, uh, all of higher ed got that. So um, we look to reduce time by, uh, reduce everyone's time by pulling together the efforts of a few to uh, work through all of the contract and the, the, the federated access, the compliance standards, um, all of those things with the vendor and get those uh, into the language so that uh, they can be there when a uh, school comes and says, I'm interested in that service. Uh, we try and pool our spend to get reduced costs, uh, reduce costs on legal negotiations as well. Uh, and then we um, share the risk uh, in a lot of those contracts by, again, pooling our uh, efforts. Um, the types of things we look for in these evaluations, and right now we're getting ready to land the plane on, on four new services. We have multiple service evaluations going on right now. We do certainly a functional review is, is, and make sure we highlight the pieces that are relevant to higher ed and, and in some cases get some changes prior to the rollout of the service. Um, we look, as I mentioned, for those integrations on network and identity. We get the compliance standards in there. We do accessibility reviews, security reviews, all of the contracting model setup so that it's as easy as, uh, in, in many cases, as um, a school just coming in and signing an order form. So um, the, there's a, a large amount of work that is done by your peers in higher ed, whether it's your um, procurement team, your legal counsel, your you know cloud technical lead, uh, identity leads, uh, they're all in there um, uh, making these things happen so that uh, as more schools come, they don't have to repeat that effort. Um, the, here's some numbers on how the ecosystem looks right now. Some of the services that are net plus services. Um, as I mentioned, we're about to uh, roll out four more. They're across the bottom of the screen there. The Air Slate, Cloud Checker Premium. Uh, what uh, is listed here is Google Suite, or sorry, G Suite Education for Enterprise is now Google Workplace for Education Plus. So GWEP instead of Giuseppe on your slide, if you're keeping track at home. And Palo Alto Networks. So those will be added to the 20 plus services that are out there now. And uh, UC Berkeley is certainly uh, taking advantage of a number of um, uh, net plus services uh, now, and hopefully they'll find others uh, attractive as we bring them on board in the future. And as I mentioned, we have a strong engagement program with these vendors. So we set up service advisory boards, when there are specifically tricky issues, we work on, um, we put together working groups to try and uh, hammer those uh, out. And um, we've had uh, recently the, um, a working group that the GCP group uh, put together was uh, around barriers to uh, rollout and adoption. Coming out of that, we put together a higher ed adoption guide for GCP. Um, uh, Oren has led a pilot of a cross-institutional training program to get the GCP leads certified as, uh, as uh, the Google professional architect. Uh, a lot of these things uh, we're able to do because schools come together and express a common need and then we work together to make it happen. And so we provide a facilitative role there. And so, uh, you know, touching back on the, the slide that uh, Oren showed earlier, uh, we really do help to facilitate this ecosystem between the vendors, the members of the community, affiliates, uh, and uh, this is all um, part of the facilitative role of uh, Internet2. And um, this is a quick graphic about the feedback loop. So as we hear requests from schools, we, our advisory boards prioritize those and champion them to the vendors. The vendors will come to the advisory boards and say, we are looking to uh, you know, roll out this feature. What do you think? And we say, that's you know that'd be great for higher ed, or maybe if you 
address it this way for this need, or sorry, that's not going to fly. Um, uh, sometimes they'll roll out something with commercial pricing that is just a non-starter for higher ed, and we push back on that. And, and, and sometimes we get our way, sometimes we don't. Here are some of the things uh, where we did get our way, uh, some examples. So um, we got adjustments on a number of services uh, to, uh, to help better meet higher ed's needs. Not, uh, not belabor the slide, but uh, it's a, a great example of the power of community when we work together. And there are a number of opportunities to get involved. Um, these slides uh, I'll be sharing with Bill afterwards and you can follow these links and there are other links at the end for uh, um, ways to contact us directly and other opportunities. But we encourage everyone, regardless of your role, to get involved in the community. There's, there's a place for everybody to contribute. And we turn it over to Dana. Thanks, Bob. Um, we can. Hi, everyone. Dana Brunson, a research engagement obsessed person. Um, so we can go to the next slide. So, research engagement at Internet 2 is not new, but is kind of new. Um, I joined a little over two years ago. And first thing I did is kind of take an inventory and notice that of all the groups you heard about, you know, there's research engagement going on. And so I tried to like squish it down into three bullet points. And so one is like direct support and collaboration with researchers and projects. So ECAS that Ananya will talk about in a second, um, the open science grid where we work with deploying these caching infrastructures for their federated data, um, the Pacific Research Platform, which I'm sure many of you are familiar with, the LSST and Fabric. Um, and then the one that's near and dear to my heart is the, the National Research Computing and Data Communities and Projects. And um, I have a couple slides to give examples with CARC and Champions and then all these other things. Um, and then the other piece is thinking of as kind of a meta research computing facilitator is bridging a lot of the traditional internet to members and communities, which are CIOs, regional networks, and, and things like that that are mostly enterprise computing and try to bridge that to the research computing professionals on campuses who are then the force multipliers to enable researchers to use those things. So next slide, please. So I want to, Internet2 supports the Campus Research Computing Consortium. I, if, there, if we had time, I'd ask for a show of hands. I hope you're familiar with this group. It started out of an NSF project. Um, so it, it, the big parts of it are the people network. So this is a year round virtual conference with various tracks for our, our taxonomy of research computing professionals with data facing, researcher facing, systems facing. I see many people on the call who do participate in these activities. Um, there's also these working groups. So we have a, a big professionalization effort because we see this as an emerging profession. You know, my dream is to have 12 year olds be able to do an internet search for, I wanna become a research computing facilitator, you know, and they'll see what the career path might look like and what it, what it looks like and how awesome it is. Um, we also, another big effort is the capabilities model for research computing and data that institutions can, you know, it's similar to like you'd see with the EDUCAUSE core data survey, but focused on enabling researchers and what your capacity is for, for helping them with their computational and data intensive work. Um, next slide, please. And then this one, the campus champion. So this has been funded out of the Exceed project that you may be familiar with. I think I joined it in 2008 or so, but this is one of the um, kind of a grassroots de facto community of practice, almost professional organization for research computing professionals. Um, it has a really active mailing list, very nice. Everybody can ask all the dumb questions they want and get 20 different answers. This is what enabled me back at Oklahoma State to grow from, you know, a one person shop with 19 users to five or six people and 1200 users. Um, so another piece of the puzzle. And then next slide, I think what you've mostly wanted to hear about 
is class. Um, so the keys here, so Internet2 and the communities that I've worked with have noted that it's really hard to help your researchers use the cloud because you don't know how to use it yourself. And most of the training is, is geared toward enterprise use cases. So what we did was bring together the three big cloud, three major cloud providers, um, research computing leads at various institutions and work together to develop what I'm about to show you. So go ahead, next slide. This is, so we, we have finished the pilot as of one o'clock today. Um, these are the institutions that were part of the pilot. So you can see your logo there, um, be proud. Um, and next slide, please. So this is, this is basically the structure of the program. Um, the big one is part one structured training. So this is basically cloud architectural concepts, um, very time intensive last two weeks, covers three cloud providers, um, workshop intensives involve each of the three cloud providers providing solutions architects to go over use cases, similar with the architectural reviews that I think Ananya will go into a little detail about, and then an ongoing community of practice. So I think there's one more slide for me. And so here's, here's just some of the feedback we've gotten about it. Um, that, that it's very positive. I'm not going to read it all, but um, they seem to really enjoy, you know, getting getting to work together to get the cloud providers to give them the kind of information that's useful for a research workflow. And they really enjoy getting to, you know, that community of practice to do peer comparisons on how people are doing various things. And I think with that, I get to hand it over to Ananya. Thank you, Daniel. Hey everyone. So uh, my role is to kind of figure out whatever services we have used so far or my colleagues have talked about so far and understand how to facilitate using those in cloud environments. And uh, next slide, please. One of the projects that is uh, helping do that is ECAS which stands for Exploring Clouds for Acceleration of Science. It's a NSF funded project and uh, Internet2 facilitated the project by basically working with the cloud, cloud providers and NSF and uh, teaching it to uh, make it a kind of a competition where uh, six projects were selected in the phase one. And of those six, two projects were uh, picked into phase two. Uh, each of them are interesting. And one of the ways to think about this particular ECAS project is it is exploring how the cloud plat platform uh, provides the capabilities. Like we talk about the scalability, we talk about the reliability and all these big words. Uh, this is kind of testing or uh, giving you context on how intense uh, data and compute workloads can be facilitated uh, on cloud. So uh, the two projects that are in phase two right now are, one of them is modeling the brains for understanding how they work better. And it has used 100,000 compute cores simultaneously to model some of the brain, like the front cortex of the brain to understand how uh, it works or how some of the models can be used to develop the science behind understanding the brain. So the other one is the Hadron Collider, which is, uh, again, it has, to understand the scale, it has like millions of collisions per second. And we have to figure out how much, like the physicists have to filter out which part of it part of the data that is being generated is supposed to be used and which has to be discarded. And so far, only a small fraction of the data that is being generated was being used. This particular project is trying to kind of make that small fraction bigger by using the heterogeneous computing that is uh, using FPGUs and GPUs as service and uh, dividing that workload into the workload that is supported by GPUs and FPGAs and uh, ASCIIs, and some of it 
the compute intensive ones uh, are divided into the ones that are processed on prem so uh, this kind of uh, puts into picture how we can figure out the workflows that can support diverse use cases that different use researchers want to use as well as we can compare some of the performance provided by the cloud platforms uh, with respect to uh, unique uh, compute as well as data requirements that researchers face day to day. And on the same lines, to facilitate uh, this particular way of using cloud, uh, Bob, can I get the next slide? Class kind of helps to bring out certain typical use cases and kind of walk the people that are supporting these researchers uh, to build different workflows to understand how the data and networking uh, is configured for these kind of use cases. Not only that, in general, to think in terms of cloud, right? Uh, how would I extend my HPC cluster onto cloud or what is an optimal way of understanding the data and networking uh, when I want to extend it from on-plan to cloud. So uh, these are the kind of things that we are trying to incorporate into the class program and kind of uh, bring out this community of practice that can produce some artifacts that can be used by uh, everybody in the community. So uh, these these, these go hand in hand in the sense that researchers are doing this work that they want to get done. At the same time, the people that are supporting them has to know how to support them to do get to get it done. And uh, that's where class comes into picture. And the next slide, please. On the same lines, we are proud to announce the 2021 summer class cohort. And we are accepting applications right now. You can learn more about it in the link provided there. And also uh, we are developing a curriculum for people who are not yet familiar with these platforms, but want to get acquainted and want to use these platforms, which is uh, a essentials curriculum uh, that we will be putting forth uh, late fall, maybe not sure on the timeline, but that is in the planning as well. That's about it for me. Back to you, Oren. Thanks. I, I think we just have a couple minutes left to take some questions or responses. So uh, chime in if you've got questions. You know, uh, Ananya, since there's a silence here, we have a few minutes. So what are some areas that higher ed, that are higher ed specific use cases um, that you've seen that aren't well documented when it comes to cloud? I'm thinking of maybe cloud enablement and org structures and are there things like that? Oh, definitely. There are like a bunch of things on, on those lines. I would say the first and foremost is facilitating the use of cloud in an organization that is like a higher ed way, like you have to cater to students, faculty, research, researchers, enterprise IT. So how would you organize it? How would you kind of uh, enable it to be used by different uh, communities that are uh, in a higher ed situation? That would be one. Not only that in general, when it comes to like a smaller use case, like researchers, right? There is all this talk about, you can use like spot instances or, you know, uh, on demand, you can request compute resources and there are ways to reserve some instances, but there is no proper documentation on how they can leverage it in a cost optimized, uh, in an optimal way to uh, kind of use it for their research. So uh, yeah, there are like different areas. You can pick each and every area and there is like one unique use case that higher ed has to face that isn't documented uh, well enough. And Bill, I, I would just chime in here and add a couple couple things, areas where we're seeing a lot of interest right now is we're seeing a ton of campuses that are really interested in replicating, <coughs> excuse me, the kind of success Berkeley's had in rolling out Jupyter notebooks across wide, wide swaths of their populations. Um, so uh, we're, we're having lots of talks with the experts at Berkeley about how, to, how people can replicate that 
that uh, effort elsewhere. And another, you know, sort of hot topic item is um, cost management in the cloud, uh, where, you know, particularly researchers are really worried that, uh, you know, they don't know how to manage what what is likely to happen in the cloud and how to, how to make sure they, they, they're they keeping within their budget. So um, so that's another topic we're, we're coordinating conversations on, and you can, we'd certainly welcome anyone getting involved in those. Great, thank you. Uh, let's see, other questions? I'm looking in the chat. I think um, Amy was asking a question. Amy, are you asking Internet2 what Berkeley's doing, or are you asking Dave? Dave is the director of our telecom network. I was thinking internet too, but uh, whoever wants to chime in. About the cloud? Well, I, actually, I was hoping that Berkeley might just have some comments. Well, and what I'll say is if you're interested in Cloud Connect or RPI, um, our information is there. You can send a note to Cloud Connect request. We'd be glad to talk with you and we'll get Scenic involved as well. And we'll have a great conversation. That's great. And if you are on the Berkeley side of it, please copy Dave Brown so he can be in the loop and help, um, help participate in that. Yeah, hi, Bill, it's Dave. I'll just add that um, we had a Cloud uh, Connect before it really wasn't used. It was only set up for some specific purposes, but we don't currently have anything funded for that. If there are people interested, then we would need to look into funding arrangements and exactly what people people want. So we're, we're not gonna build it and they will come. It's more yeah. of a build as needed approach. Oh yes, I, that, what I left out is that you do need to pay the cloud providers. That, that is an important part of this. So, so yes, identifying the funding is, is just right. So, but we'll be here whenever that happens. Just keep the email address or look yep. on our website. And if, you, if, if anybody at uh, Berkeley has that kind of a need, reach out to Isaac Orr um, and they can work with you on determining requirements and what would best meet those requirements. Great. Any last questions before we wrap it? I know that on our side, we have an all staff and it's after five for those people on the East Coast uh, at Internet too. Great. Uh, Amy, is there one more slide with our next uh, meeting or Tiffany? Yeah, let me share that right now. Okay, so we hope to see you on May 27th. We will have speakers from University of Michigan Health uh, brought in by our research IT uh, group. And uh, I don't have a lot of the details on that. Amy, did you know any more specifics to? You know, I think we're still working out the specifics on that. And so um, we'll be sure to send out that announcement once all those speakers are finalized and ready. Excellent. And so if you're subscribed to Meetup, dot com uh, our site you can get it there otherwise if you're in the berkeley side community of practice it'll appear on your google calendar thank you everybody for coming out and uh, thank you so much to everyone from internet too that was super interesting and informative uh, have a great one and thanks for coming thanks everybody thanks for having us